Good morning. I am uh, very happy to uh, talk to all of you today on a very special uh, topic on in healthcare infrastructure and COVID day. We have uh, experts in our panel, but before I hand over to the experts, a quick introduction about myself. I am the CEO of the Hinduja Hospital and also the co-chair of FIKI Health Services Committee. So, as you all know, that as we are battling the second wave and preparing for the potential third wave, the rise in positive cases and deaths have compelled uh, the government to revisit the current vaccination strategy. And we are focusing on 100% vaccination, vaccination co uh, coverage as a rational way to curb this pandemic. Currently, the government has, uh, the country has vaccinated more than 24 crore uh, people more 24 crore doses in the country. And a rapidly dropping vaccination uh, rate uh, has happened in the past uh, month or so. And it is probably due to the uh, reduction in vaccine supply. And also the considering the large population size, we need to increase the vaccination maybe five times uh, to what today's level is. And in some states like in North, uh, like UP and Bihar, we, maybe we'll have to uh, make it eight to nine times to reach the target of vaccinating all adults by December 2021. Now, there are reports which are suggestive that children below 18 years of age are also uh, are, are likely to get infected during the third wave. And vaccines for this age group is not available now. And in preparation for that, many states have already begun ramping up the beds and intensive care beds uh, for children, strengthening the pediatric wards, and uh, oxygen beds. Now, whether it will happen or not, and I hope it doesn't happen, but uh, we will hear from our experts on that. The impact of COVID has turned out to be more profound in rural India, as the tier two and tier three cities have witnessed a higher uh, fatality rate comparatively, and probably because of lack of awareness, reluctance, fear of testing, maybe some hesitancy on the vaccine, have been the factors which have been uh, uh, which have resulted in this. Now, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare released the SOP on COVID-19 containment and management in peri-urban, rural, and tribal areas to enable communities to strengthen the primary level health infrastructure at all levels to in intensify our response. Telemedicine, video consultation, consultation facilities, strengthening existing healthcare infrastructure sensitization against vaccination hesitancy with the help of gram panchayats forming covid support centers at panchayat block and district level has to be encouraged we require an intensive action plan focused on in enhancing vaccination coverage stronger surveillance system to test track and trace cases and effective communication strategies identifying the non icu medical personnel and training them in oxygen therapy icu management pediatric healthcare COVID care management, along with implementing the training programs for other paramedics is the need of the hour. The government of Maharashtra has set up a dedicated task force focusing on management of COVID-19 in children and development of necessary uh, treatment modalities. I'm happy to say that doc I'm going to introduce one of the panelists, Dr. Prabhu. He's the chairman of the task force. We also need to reevaluate the existing healthcare system to enhance our ability to fight back any such upcoming wave soon. This needs a robust and transparent sharing of data, as well as extensive uh, collaboration from all the public and private stakeholders. FIKI has been actively engaged with various, various ministries, NHA, Niti Ayo, WHO, as well as the empowered groups under the Disaster Management Act 2005 at multiple levels through the policy interventions through advocacy, representation and reports, strategic support for surveys for identifying resources, and facilitating logistics and mobility for human resources and medical supplies and equipment across the country for information, education, and communication. FIKI also in collaboration with Tech Mahindra set up a 24 by seven helpline to advise patients regarding available private sector facilities earlier for non-COVID and then for COVID patients. With the onset of second wave, FIKI had constituted a COVID crisis management group led by the Vice President, Mr. Subrakan, uh, Subrakant Panda. The group consisted of various industry leaders who have been brainstorming and focusing on the key concerns like COVID infrastructure, 
oxygen concentrators, supply, supply of medical devices, pharma products, as well as vaccination. FIKI has made several recommendations to the Honorable Prime Minister, NEGVAC, and the Health Minister giving suggestions to help augment the capacity and measures with the aim to jointly fight the current COVID crisis. I'm very happy today that we have an esteemed panel of experts today uh, from the pediatrics uh, speciality to discuss and enlighten all of us on what their view is about the third way. And, uh, and I'm going to introduce them who will now talk about what are they have been their experiences and what they think should be done to address the uh, oncoming third wave if it comes at all. So my pleasure first to introduce Dr. Suhas Prabhu. Dr. Su yes, thank you. Welcome Dr. Prabhu. So Dr. Prabhu is the MD pediatric BCH and MNAMS in pediatrics. He's been a consulting pediatricians at the Hinduja hospital since 1986. He is the ex honorary pediatricians for Baba Hospital Kurla. Uh, and now he's the chairperson for the government of Maharashtra task force of, for pediatric COVID-19. Welcome Dr. Prabhu. My pleasure to introduce Dr. Nitin Shah. Dr. Nitin Shah is the head of the section of pediatrics at the Hinduja Hospital. He is also the national, uh, is a member of the national pediatric task force, Lancet India pediatric task force for COVID. He is the past president for the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and also an honorary consultant at the pediatric hematologist oncologist at BJ Vadia Hospital for Children. Also my pleasure, thank you, welcome Dr. Shah. My pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pranjal, Dr. Pranjal Sate Kali. She is the, uh, she is an MD and fellowship with the fellowship in pediatric uh, critical care. She is uh, also a consultant pediatrician with the uh, Hinduja Hospital, Fidi Hinduja Hospital been trained in pediatric critical care. She has over 10, 20 years of experience in clinical pediatrics and has been closely associated with NGOs catering to kids with, kids with special needs and autism. So my pleasure and uh, the panel will be moderated by Dr. Pranjal, who will take the views of Dr. Shah and Dr. Prabhu. I'm sure it is going to be an enlightening panel. So thank you, welcome and over to you Dr. Pranjal. Mm -hmm. well uh, thank you, Mr. Shah, uh, Mr. Khanna, for setting up this base for this webinar. Well, in pediatrics, we have always learned prevention is better than cure, which is the first step towards health. Second step is early detection and awareness is the key for it. Timely and proper treatment, which leads to sm smooth and complete recovery, is the third step towards health. Today, I have a privilege uh, to have a webinar with two stalwarts of pediatric fraternity who have been working relentlessly in the same direction. So children of our country can stay healthy and if need be, can regain that health. So Dr. Prabhu, I would start the discussion with you today. Uh, first, I would like to ask your view about third way impacting uh, kids. Is the fear real? Uh, thank you, Fiki, for giving us this platform and thank you, Dr. Pranjal, Mr. Khanna for introducing us. Okay, coming to the third wave, we have seen that this virus occurs in waves in so many countries. There is no reason to expect why our country will be spared. So we have seen these third waves occurring in many of the Western nations. And in Delhi, they have already recorded not third, but even a fourth wave. So it's logical to expect that there might be a third wave. So that's the first part. The second part is why will it affect children more? And the part of the reason for that is we've seen in the first wave, it's primarily the elderly who were badly affected. In the second wave, the age group moved, moved to the younger ones. And now it's the time turn possibly of the children. The other reason is the fact that while we have a vaccination program in place and we've already immunized so many adults and the elderly population, so far the vaccine is not available for children below the age of 18. So it's only reasonable to expect that if the third wave comes, the children are likely to be more affected than the adults. Thank you. Dr. Shah, coming to you, this virus has been around for the last 15 months. So what has been your experience about disease profile in children and what has been the need for healthcare facilities? And if you can also add on, what is your view about uh, if the pattern is going to change in coming days? 
So, first of all, thanks to Fikki for this wonderful opportunity. Also, thanks Mr. Khanna for the lavish introduction. Coming to the question, Pranjal, as very rightly said, the virus is around for 15 months. What we saw in the last uh, uh, first wave was that the children were generally not affected or not symptomatic. What we are seeing in the second wave is that the children are getting more affected and also more symptomatic. But yet it's very reassuring that less than one to five percent of the children are actually symptomatic. So around eight to 10 percent of the total COVID in the country has been in children. And of these children, less than 10 to 20 percent are symptomatic. And of the symptomatic, less than one to five percent actually get hospitalized. And of those who are getting hospitalized, less than two percent actually die. So I'm trying to relieve the tension saying that death is almost unknown in pediatric practice. Having said that, the children, when they present with COVID, they are either tested when they are asymptomatic because they're in contact with the parents, which is the primary source for them getting the infection. Or if they were infected for whatever reason, they usually had, if they were symptomatic, mild cough, cold, and fever, which would last for three to four days and not beyond like any other viral fever. Peculiarly, children as compared to adults also come with GI symptoms in the form of diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. But again, as I said, most of them are uh, mild and they are okay at home care with symptomatic treatment. Now, those with comorbidities, like say, patients who are immunocompromised, cancer patients, patient of stem cell transplant, patient of steroids, patient with diabetes or kidney problem in children, they can get more symptomatic, they can get hospitalized. And almost uh, we did a study uh, under the Lancet group of 2,600 children admitted uh, in the 10 major hospitals in the country we found that almost 40% of them had comorbidity. And even in those, the mortality was less than 2%. Now coming to the change in the, uh, uh, the presentation, as I said, this wave, the children were more symptomatic than the last wave, though most of them were mild or not even moderate. And we have seen, as we discussed, that children also get into what we call MIS-C, or the multi infinity system uh, syndrome of children. Last year, we saw this MIS-C used to come almost a month or two after they developed COVID. Whereas in this season, we have seen many times there's an overlap between an acute COVID and the MIS-C, saying that many of these MIS-C children were also COVID RT-PCR positive, besides being antibody positive. So that's the change in the clinical spectrum we have seen. But again, I reiterate, most of the children who have had symptoms are mild, and they have been treated at home without any complication. Well, it's, uh, it's relieving to hear that from uh, you, sir. So in the same line, Dr. Prabhu, if I ask you that we keep on listening about different variants and mutations of this virus, uh, it has changed the disease profile and the vaccine prevention profile as well in adults. So what is your uh, opinion about this variance uh, affecting children in coming days? Thank you for that question. I think there's a lot of concern everywhere about uh, variants. In fact, there is a term coined variants of concern, VOC. So what happens really is that the variation occurs because of a mutation in the virus. Now mutations, remember, happen by random. Sometimes they are nonsense mutations, so they don't really change anything in the virus, but they can change four characteristics of the virus. One, it can change the rate of transmission so that the virus becomes more easily transmissible from one to another. So this accounts for more rapid spread from one person to another. That's the first change. The second variation that can occur is the lethality. That is the chances of getting a complication or getting you know, mortality and death also occurring will be more if it is more lethal. The third is what is called as escape variants. That is the virus is able to escape the antibodies that are produced. Now, this may be either because of a natural infection, previous infection, or because of vaccination. But the concern really here is that if you can escape your antibodies, then you can possibly get a second and maybe even a third infection. So that's the third one. And the fourth, of course, which is less uh, relevant for this virus mm -hmm. is drug resistance. We know that uh, drugs uh, of course, they have very limited role, at least in children, but drugs like remdesivir and favipiravir have been used. Yes, the virus can develop the ability to develop resistance, and therefore these drugs will not work. Now, just one point I want to add. Mutations, as I said, occur by random. There, even the virus doesn't know. It doesn't deliberately mutate into something. This happened by chance. But we know, and... Uh, 
we know this for long. Darwin said so, that it's survival of the fittest. So if by chance there is a mutation that confers any of these four properties on the virus, that virus is more likely to propagate and survive. So that is the concern regarding the variants. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Prabhu, for putting the scientific uh, knowledge in uh, terms which a layman will be able to understand easily. Uh, well, Dr. Shah, uh, a little deviated, but maybe very pertinent question right now, which all our children and their parents are going through is, our children have been homebound for more than a year and few more months definitely will be like this. The routine has been disrupted. So what has been your experience about the psychological impact of this pandemic lifestyle on this growing brain along with the physical impact? I think uh, Pranjal, uh, you have really hit uh, on the nail, I would say, because uh, people are worried about the physical illness because of COVID, which of course we are worried looking at what happens to the adults. But as I say, children have usually very mild COVID. But what we have not concentrated on is the mental health of the child. Now, there has been a recent meta-analysis of 15 studies in 10 different countries on more than 23,000 children. So it's like a large study and adolescents, of course, and looked at the mental health issues. And the same study found that 80% of the children were actually psychologically affected by the current COVID outbreak. Almost 22% feared of COVID-19. So they will keep on talking about the side effects and the deaths following COVID. One third of them had boredom, as you very rightly said, they are homebound, they are not allowed to go down and play. There is no peer to peer uh, meeting at the schools, which used to happen, and there is no so, uh, family uh, picnic. So, leads to tremendous boredom. That boredom leads to increased uh, use of the flat screen, like mobile, TVs, etc. Also, not only for schooling, but even for entertainment, that again alienates them from the parents and you know they don't talk to one another. 20% of the children have sleep disturbance. And have you ever had massive weight gain in the children? Almost every child has put on eight to 10 kilos in the last one and a half years. Now, you know, obesity itself is a risk factor for COVID. So if the children become morbidly obese, then, they, uh, obese, then there's going to be trouble when they develop COVID. Now coming to the caretakers, the parents or whosoever, grandparents, 50% of these caretakers had anxiety, either because of their own getting illness or more if what will happen if the child gets COVID positive, you know? Without realizing that even if the child being COVID positive is going to be mild, they are very anxious about the health of the children. They are also anxious about the outcome of this COVID, about what will happen to the future of children because they are not studying, especially if they are in 9th, 10th, 11th grade, the career deciding years, what will happen to them without exams, etc. That has been a tremendous anxiety in the caretaker. And almost one fourth of his parents or grandparents are also depressed seeing all this. So I think this is something which we need to really tackle in a very large way. In fact, I remember a frantic call from a mother of a child who was around eight years saying that the child is saying, I'm going to jump out of the window because I'm bored of this COVID. So, you know, it, it needed really a lot of uh, uh, then uh, help for the child, psychological and by a psychiatrist with some drugs to reduce his anxiety that we can, we could turn around the child from these suicidal thoughts. So Lancet, Pediatric task force has been very categorically demanding that we have to improve and do uh, a lot of training of the doctors and of the lay people about these health issues which are being faced by children and their caretakers uh, uh, together. Dr. Pranjal, may I add something? Please, sir. At Hinduja Please, Hospital sir. Mahim, I am the principal investigator and we are doing a study for the last one year now on the psychological effects of children. I have a postgraduate student doing it. And uh, we, have found, we have done over 100 cases so far. The analysis is incomplete. But we are finding significant effects, like Dr. Shah mentioned about becoming obese or getting addicted to the mobile or having sleep disturbances, crying spells, and so on in more than one third of the children. So I just wanted to add that is our data too. I mean, COVID has taken away many things, but has taught us also. It has taught us to look at life more holistically. And uh, as WHO has said, uh, it's not only absence of disease what is health, but there is physical, mental, and other aspect also which defines health. And I think looking forward, we will be looking at health in that way. Well, uh, Dr. Prabhu, COVID has again taught us something else that a stitch in time saves nine, maybe a harder way as far as adults is concerned. Yes. So as community or country, how prepared are we 
to safeguard our kids against COVID if it hits us in coming future? Are we ready for it? That's a very important question. That's the burning question for today, Dr. Pranjal. Uh, but I think we have learned a lesson from our, shall I use the word, underpreparedness for the second wave. It has hit hard and we found we were found wanting in several respects. So it's very nice, in fact, that everybody's talking about preparedness for the third wave. And as uh, Mr. Khanna has already mentioned, our state government has already made a task force. Several states have done that, even the national government has done that, so that we will be better prepared for the third wave. Now, if you want to know what we can, how we can prepare for the third wave, there are at least on three fronts we can prepare. One is the fact that we need to have a uniform protocol for management. What's happened is that COVID has been an evolving disease. Even doctors have been learning over the last one year as, as to what works and what does not work. So there is so much confusion. What was right treatment six months ago is incorrect now. So we need this up-to-date information to be disseminated to every practitioner and we will need every practitioner. Although I'm talking about children with COVID, we cannot restrict this to only the pediatricians. We're gonna need, as they say, all hands on deck, the family practitioners, the general physicians, the government doctors, everybody needs to be on board and everybody needs to have the training, the understanding of how to recognize the disease, how to manage the over 80% which are mild at home with telemedicine as Dr. Shah already explained to you, and the small percentage that are going to need hospitalized and need management. So the first aspect is telling doctors, and they are not really fully aware now, of what is the way to manage this pandemic. The second part is we are going to need equipment. We are going to need facilities for treating these children. Fortunately, the majority of patients can be treated at home. So the number of beds that are required proportionately in children will not be as much as it was in adults. Nevertheless, there is a plan to scale up the beds, at least in Maharashtra, by five times the current rate so that there will be enough beds. And these beds are, of course, not just the ICU beds or the patients are really sick. There are children who are moderately ill or they are maybe even mildly ill, but there are no facilities and their home, their homes may be small, there may be comorbid elderly patients, they may not have enough toilet facilities and so on. So, you know, quarantining is not possible. So some children, these kind of children also, because of lack of facilities at home, will have to be hospitalized. I mean, I'm using the word hospitalized, it's not going to be a hospital, it's going to be a COVID care center. So we're going to need these centers So for children. So that also will have to be arranged and we'll need to upgrade our PICUs and HDUs and for that, we're going to need additional equipment. We're going to need ventilators. We're going to need syringe pumps. And of course, we're going to need staff that is well-trained to handle these children there. And pediatric intensive care nursing is really a specialized uh, branch. And Dr. Pranjal, you are an intensivist. You know that every pediatrician or general practitioner will not know how to ventilate, say, a, a 15 kilogram child. So that calls for expertise, so that has to be done. And the third point I want to talk about and of course, there's going to be a need of medications also. We've learned a lesson from the lack of oxygen that we faced in the second wave. So that's going to be, I won't use the word holding, but there's going to be arrangements made to see that we don't run short of these medicines like oxygen. And in children particularly, although we don't use so much of remdesivir, tocilizumab, or favipiravir at all, we use other drugs. We need methylprednisolone. We need a drug called intravenous immunoglobulin, which is hardly used in adults. So we need to make sure that these are available. But lastly, the most important thing that we need to educate the public. They need to know that their, child, their children are safe. They need to know how to recognize and not keep fever children at home. Seek aid and be assured that the physician they are going to, it may be the local family doctor, it may be a pediatrician, it may be a government clinic. They all are on the same page. They know exactly what to do and the child is in safe hands. The second thing they need to know is that when the child is at home, while he may be mild initially, there are chances that he may deteriorate. So they need to know how to monitor the child at home. This will be of course explained by the doctor treating. So this is the concept of telemedicine that Dr. Shart spoke about. The child is at home, the doctor is monitoring from his clinic on a daily basis or maybe even more often so that the child 
if he starts deteriorating the the uh, help uh, is at hand and he can be referred immediately so there are certain what we call red flag signs that the mother or the caregiver at home needs to recognize so that they can immediately alert the doctor and take the child so i think these are the aspects that our task force has recommended the government and i think the, we are making good progress and hopefully we should be ready for the third wave if and when it comes thank you yeah our children are not miniature adults and i don't think so we can share the same infrastructure with adult setup especially human power or the manpower i understand well dr shah coming to you in adults we have seen seen certain issues with the drugs the equipments and the treatment per se causing problems so this was because of lack of protocols or the protocols were not uniformly distributed or uh, disseminated so do you think so our do we have any protocols in children so we don't go through the same mistakes which adult men went through because our children are more sensitive in all these aspects so dr pranjal as i said in the first wave hardly any children were symptomatic and those who were admitted had massive comorbidities so they were in tertiary care hospitals where these protocols were in place in the second wave suddenly pediatrician have been also become busy like the physician in treating this patient of course all of them are mild at home but they learn that they have to be prepared it's not that children don't get covid so i think after that now we have made protocols and in fact there are several protocols uh, you can get a lot of protocol from who and international agencies which may or may not be as applicable in our milieu uh, like developing country as india is so we have a central government protocol for management of pediatric covid largely based on what the aims uh, protocol for pediatric uh, uh, treatment of co pediatric covid was and in fact they had uh, held a national meeting uh, where lot of pediatrician and family physician also attended uh, to that first uh, protocol that was uh, released by all india institute of medical sciences now indian academy of pediatric which is the largest body of more than 40000 pediatrician and which has also an influence on all the pediatrician and some family physician across the country they already made one treatment protocol a few months back and i believe it's being revised now based on the experience of the second wave and that second version of the protocol is going to be released in next few days so again that's a very popular protocol with pediatrician it's a simple algorithm based protocol so it's easy for pediatrician to follow is like a ready rekna and lastly as dr prabhu said maharashtra task force has made its own protocol which was essentially for family physicians and anganwadi workers too because they are the ones who may not be completely trained but still need to recognize when to refer a serious patient uh, to the higher center and which one should treat at their local level and with what minimum drugs which are already available similar task force are there in many other states and within the states in many districts especially in those which are at risk to develop a lot of covid patient based on the experience and as i am a member of the uh, Uh, the lancet uh, covid pediatric task force we have very recently released just 48 hours before which is available online a very simple protocol for management of pediatric covid again it has a background paper and a algorithm for management of covid in general and of the misc and the misc also those which are not life threatening and the misc which are life threatening and which drug to use at what dose etc and how to what test to do which test not to do and you know how to follow up them so very precise and but in a concise manner it may be in two or three pages the whole algorithm is over so any of these protocols are valid for management of the pediatric patient and now the question will come how to dissipate this protocol to the end user because is one to make a scientific protocol is other to dissipate it to the people and i think that's where the capacity building is going to happen both from the center and the state whichever protocol you use but that has to be dissipated so the indian academy of pediatrics is already doing iap pediatric covid training the central government is already doing through aims and otherwise the state government as dr prabhu said is already held two meetings where more than 1 lakh doctors and paramedics were uh, on, uh, live attending this and now they have the protocol with them and the lancet pediatric with the ministry of health at the center is going to very soon start capacity building and uh, training of the trainer so that these protocols can percolate down to the smallest place so dr prabhu you have been uh, involved uh, in streamlining the pediatric covid care and as dr nitin shah said there are multiple protocols so how are we going to have a uniform dissipation especially to the gra grassroots level and training the main man force which basically includes the asha workers as well 
Okay. Uh, while Dr. Shah mentioned that there are several protocols available, I must mention that the differences between them are really minor. So you could use any one. Some of them are, shall we say, tweaked or modified based on the ground realities that are there, because some things are simply not possible in the rural areas. And that's one thing we need to remember, that while we spoke about the third wave occurring more, more in children, I would also imagine that the third wave is going to be more in the rural areas where the medical facilities are going to be less. The first wave hit the cities very badly. The second wave, we see a lot of uh, tier two and tier three cities, but now it might be the turn of the villages. So we need to have a protocol that is practically implementable at the peripheral level. So nothing really much different about these protocols. There's no need to get confused because there are so many protocols. They are basically all the same. Okay. How do we make sure that this message goes out everywhere? Dr. Shah has already mentioned that we had two massive webinars. The first one was attended by 84,000 people, which was on Facebook and YouTube. That uh, module or that webinar is still available for review by anybody. We had a second one, which was meant for Anganwadi workers or ASHA workers, which happened in the uh, first week of June. That was attended by another 65,000. And I must mention that these were conducted, at least the second one particularly was conducted in the local language so that the people at the periphery, periphery are able to understand. That's it. What more can we do? We are trying to disseminate this to, through the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Shah already mentioned that. The Maharashtra State of IAP I know because I'm uh, related to the task forces in collaboration with them. We have done over one dozen webinars in addition to the first one that we did, disseminating the same module. We are in the process of making posters, handbooks, which will be disseminated in every public health, uh, uh, public health center unit in the periphery, the Gramin Rungnales, that is the village hospitals, and it will be disseminated everywhere so that it's easy. There's gonna be one poster for the red flag signs, one poster for what is home care. So we are trying to disseminate this information as widely as possible so that it reaches the common man. So that's our plan for uh, making sure that the message goes everywhere. Is, uh, does that answer your question or you want me to answer yes, something? Yes, yes. No, actually it's heartening to see the government's proactiveness this time, supporting the doctor body as well. So there's a coordination happening which will uh, help us uh, win right. over if COVID affects uh, children. Well, uh, again, we just now discussed about the rural and urban area. Though we are training the manpower, there is a gap between the infrastructure or the healthcare facilities between rural and urban. Mr. Khanna initially said that tier three, uh, two and three cities did take a brand. So how are we going to take bridge this gap between the healthcare facilities or the infrastructure between the rural and the urban areas? Right. So this is a very important thing because I just spoke to you that in the peripheries, we don't really have all the facilities. In every village, there won't be a PICU for treating a very sick child. So what we are doing it in two ways. For this home care, remember, one of the very important things in COVID is monitoring of the oxygen level, for which, you know, we use something called as a pulse oximeter. Now that's freely available in the cities. It's It costs about a few thousand rupees, which for a city dweller is not really a problem. But what happens in the rural areas? So what we have proposed to the government and the government has agreed is that every PHC, primary health care center, will stock these oximeters, maybe a dozen, two dozen of them, which can be distributed or loaned, will be loaned to the patients who are diagnosed with COVID for home monitoring. Then the second problem that may come is that we have parents or caregivers in the rural areas who are not, they're illiterate. They won't even know how to do it how to monitor, how to write, how to communicate. They don't even have a smartphone. How to communicate the data back to the treating officer by telemedicine. So for that, the government is recruiting, at least this is a plan for Maharashtra, and I'm sure it can be replicated elsewhere, that the Anganwadi workers, they will be going from home to home and helping parents in monitoring these children at home, train them on how to use the pulse oximeter, or if the pulse oximeters are inadequate, the Anganwadi workers can carry one from home to home, do the monitoring at least twice a day and do the reporting. So this is what we have planned for the rural areas. The second thing is, as I mentioned earlier, that we don't really have ICUs everywhere. So we have proposed to the government what is called as a hub and spoke model. 
there will be centers where the PICUs or HDUs are there, maybe the district hospitals where such facilities are available. And we, the government is not beyond roping in or recruiting private practitioners who may have a nursing home with high, high dependency units or a PICU for this in small towns where the government doesn't have enough facility. So it's going to be a private public partnership. As I said earlier, all hands on deck, everybody has to cooperate, then only we can win. So the government is in the process of getting the data from all pediatricians in Maharashtra. We are trying to collect the data on a Google sheet, how many pediatricians are there, what kind of facilities they have, how many are willing to convert their facilities into a COVID care center, how many have ventilators, how many have oxygen beds and so on. So once all that data is there, and fortunately we have time, we have started early, we have prepared early, and hopefully the third wave we have at, is at least a month away. So we have time to get collate all this data so we can plan accordingly. So that's what the, we are going to do in the rural areas. So we rope in the private practitioners, we use the Anganwadi workers in home care, and we're going to use hub and spoke model. We have proposed transport ambulances, which are adequately equipped so that even a distance of 30, 40 miles or 40 kilometers can be covered safely with proper care during the transport so that the child reaches the uh, HDU or the PICU safely for proper care ahead. Thank you. It seems to be a mammoth task, and I'm sure lots of brainstorming is, uh, is behind this. So Dr. Shah, uh, Prabhu sir just now said about the private setup. And so far, we have seen only minuscule number of private setups coming forward and helping our kids who are suffering with COVID. So do you think so? As Dr. Prabhu said, even in urban areas, private setups will come forward and will have collaborations with the government setup to help our kids if need be. So that's a very important question as to where do the children go? And I think uh, it already in the second wave, I have known several pediatricians who offer their hospitals for the care of COVID, not only for adults, but also for children. Now, in past, there was a lot of confusion about who can admit a COVID patient. And because pediatric COVID was so low till the second wave, that pediatrician really did not sort of bother to keep their hospitals ready to treat a pediatric COVID patient. But as a second wave, there were a lot of pediatric COVID patients and some of them, as Dr. Prabhu said, had to be isolated away from the home and they found it easy to go to their private pediatricians if not going to the public COVID care center. So in many states, I know, the local authorities were very helpful in granting permission to allow these COVID patients to be admitted in nursing homes. Now, as I said, many of them may not need too much of sophisticated treatment. So they were okay to be admitted in such hospitals, provided they take care or take they take all the care of how to handle a COVID patient, including the sanitization, not allowing exposure to the other people around, the staff being trained. Uh, if this is a central air conditioned place, then to cut off that area from the central is so that the virus doesn't spread to the non-COVID area and so on and so forth. With all those things in background, many of these nursing homes actually offered uh, treatment to this pediatric COVID patient in the level two, level three cities. Now coming to the tertiary care, because you will need a lot of ICU beds if there is going to be a severe COVID wave in children in the third wave. Of course, first of all, I have my own reservation that I have a hope and I, I hope it doesn't happen. But should it happen, we should be prepared. So I think a lot of private hospitals, including the tertiary care hospital like the Hinduja Hospital, which was so far not having separate pediatric COVID facility because there was no need to have one. As I said, there were hardly any admission in the pediatric sector. Now have prepared on their own. Like talking about PD Induja Hospital and being the section coordinator of pediatrics uh, with the management, we have already started making a pediatric COVID ward, which is separate because see, this is not just a physical ward. It would need parent to stay with the child. What if the parent is negative? What if the parent is positive? Who will treat that adult and child combination, etc.? Uh, how will you segregate child cry? So has to be away from the adults, etc. So all those things are taken care of. And we have to also make enough pediatric ICU beds. Because if suppose severe COVID or a severe MIS-C, more than COVID, a MIS-C may come more, with more severe case in children, especially in adolescent. So you need to have preparedness to have these pediatric ICU beds also in these tertiary care hospitals as in when so as much as possible. So we have also enabled in Hindu hospital within the pediatric COVID ward to have some pediatric ICU beds. So I think 
if Hinduja Hospital is done, I'm sure a lot of other hospitals in the city like Mumbai and also such cities all over the country can actually offer uh, beds for pediatric patient and keep them ready and do not give it to the adults to share. Keep it reserved for pediatric. We will help a long way to alleviate the anxiety in the minds of the parents that where will I check my child if he becomes serious. So he has the now choice to go to a public hospital, which was already admitting pediatric patient, a, pedi a public COVID center where children were so far not kept easily. Now they'll be able to keep or to go to a private hospital, either a nursing home or a tertiary care hospital like ours, so that the, the parents are now relieved that if something happens to the child, there is somewhere that they can go. I think that itself will bring down the anxiety in the mind of people. It's better to be prepared than to regret. Uh, and so far, COVID has given us multiple opportunities to regret. Right. Well, uh, Dr. Shah, uh, well, uh, we started our session with saying that prevention is the first step towards health. So what are your inputs about preventing strategies as far as pediatric COVID is concerned, including your favorite subject, which is vaccines? <laughs> so uh, first of all, we have known that as children are not going to the school, they, many of them don't go down to play with other children where they can get infection from other child who is asymptomatic. So the only way a child as on today gets COVID is from the parents or someone from the family members. And that has been the experience that almost 80 to 90% of pediatric COVID patients that we have seen in second wave have been because of someone in the family having COVID. So if you have prevented COVID in adults, and you have isolated those adults away from the children, that itself will prevent COVID in children. So I think more and more adults get vaccinated, lesser and lesser adults will get infected, lesser and lesser of them will give it to the children. The second thing is the schools cannot remain closed forever. The schools will have to reopen someday. And I think there are several countries where if they reach a threshold of 60, 70% of vaccination in the community, they have opened up the school. Like say Israel is one such experience. So if that is happening, then we also need to vaccinate children because they are the vaccinate children from 12 to 18 years. And now they are also going to vaccinate children from six to 12 years. And there are several vaccines which have trial done like the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine have already shown a near 100% efficacy in the trial form in against any severity of COVID in children. And there are several vaccines which are undertaking trial like our own Bharat Biotech's Covaxin has very recently started the trial in 12 to 18 year old children. So I think we can also vaccinate children so that they are also directly benefited besides being indirectly benefited by adults vaccinated in the home. And third thing is whether you have taken vaccine as an adult or a child, there is no respite to the physical distancing, wearing the proper mask and sanitization uh, to continue till you have actually eradicated this virus from the world. So I think we'll have to keep on training the children. In fact, children are more uh, now easily trained in last one year that they automatically would wash the hand, they will sanitize the hand, they will adjust the mask. Even when they come to our clinic, we see a two and three year old children who actually by definition don't have to wear a mask, but they still wear a mask very happily. And I think more so when they go to school, that they need to have this etiquette, what you call COVID appropriate behavior to be followed to the core so that they don't infect themselves, other children and the teachers in the school or the elderly back home. So these are the various prongs of strategy that you can use to prevent COVID in children. Well, uh, it's nice to hear that so many things have been thought about and implemented so our future generation stays protected. So as we are coming to end of this webinar, Dr. Shah, can you say a few words concluding about where exactly we stand as far as COVID in children is concerned? So point one, COVID in children was little more symptomatic in the second wave than in the first wave, but it was always mild in 99%. Point two, children with comorbidities can have severe COVID and we have lost even some children who had diabetes, renal failure or malignancy, but that's rare. A common healthy child is not going to die of COVID is what the parents need to understand. Point number three, there are ways and means of treating the children and now we are doing capacity building so that more and more family physicians and pediatricians will know how to treat a child at home and when to refer them. And lastly, if they need reference to a higher center, both in the rural and in the urban areas, both in the private sector and the public sector, we are already preparing for them to be admitted in some appropriate center. So there is nothing to panic 
as to where will I take my child if the child becomes serious. So I think that's a message I want to go through Fiki to the parents and to the public at large that we are going to be well prepared for that third wave should it happen. But my gut feeling is that the third wave probably will not happen. And at least children will not be as badly affected as we are all worried about today. Dr. Prabhu, your words uh, in want nutshell. To, I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> I think the second wave has made us wise. Yes, we were underprepared at that time, as I said at the beginning, but we are wise. As I mentioned earlier, I think we are well in time. I believe this country is capable. We have the resources. We have the doctors. We, we know what to do. And uh, I think the government is also galvanized now. And we are willing to have a public-private partnership, whether it is between the government doctors, the private practitioners, the corporate hospitals. We are all in this together. We have to succeed. And I want to end by quoting this Boy Scout motto. If we are prepared, be prepared. We shall win. Hum honge kamya. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, nature has uh, protected our kids so far and it has given us time to think and learn from mistakes which has been happened in adults. So I'm sure your inputs, which were based on knowledge and experience, would help uh, the, our audience to understand pediatric COVID and if needed, take proper steps so we can safeguard our future generation from COVID-19 impact. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Dr. Pranjal, for conducting such a wonderful panel. And thank you, Dr. Prabhu and Dr. Uh, Shah. I mean, excellent insights, of course, based on your uh, experience and knowledge and what you have, and you spoke about partnership, government, private, nursing homes. And I think excellent point made by Dr. Shah on, you know, the guidelines being shared by 40,000 pediatricians and some uh, general practitioners. I think those uh, along with the government guidelines will go a long way and the insights about infrastructure. I think that is very reassuring. I'm sure many parents and many people will be reassured that uh, your question on where to take the children if something happens, although we hope that nothing will happen. And, and I, I just want to thank all three of you uh, for a great uh, session. I have learned and I'm sure many people uh, would learn from this. And like you said, uh, Dr. Shah, like they say in, uh, you know, that may your words come true, third wave will not happen. <laughs> and, and Dr. Prabhu, as he says that we are now wise and we know what to do. And hopefully with collaboration and knowledge, this will never uh, come to pass. And our country, like he said, we are, a, you know, we, we are now wise and we will defeat it. So with that words, uh, thank you so much, all of you, for taking your time uh, on a Monday morning for uh, one hour for this crucial topic. I'm sure the country will appreciate your efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.